Hello, my name is Jack Finucane from the Boston Sack Shop and I've made this video to share with you and show you a pristine factory original Selmer Mark VI saxophone. And I've chosen to do this because for my personal aesthetic of repair style, I have uh, made it my goal to do saxophone restoration as opposed to um, just saxophone overhauls, meaning that my approach is to try and recreate as, as close as possible the original look and feel of these instruments as they left the factory. I personally believe, and again, the key word there being personal, um, that the craftsmen and artisans who made these instruments and sent them out into the world to professionals um, knew what they were doing. I think every single choice of material and placement was intentional and well thought out. I mean, if you think about it, these are the same materials that were on John Coltrane's saxophone, on Charlie Parker's saxophone, and that to me is significant. So this video is intended for repair technicians who maybe have not seen a completely original saxophone, um, and in this case we're talking about Selmer saxophones, even though I'd love to do more videos, um, breakdowns of all the original materials on other great American saxophones like Kahn and King and, and Bisher. And it's also for people who own um, vintage Selmer horns so they can see what the factory intended them to look like. So we are going to go into a lot of detail here. I really want to show you every single material and placement on the horn. And for the technicians, I'm going to tell you the materials that I've chosen to use to replicate the original materials on um, the horn that we're about to see. Okay. So in the next section of video, we're going to go into much more detail on this beautiful saxophone. But before we get started, I just wanted to go through some basic terminology on systems of the saxophone so that we're all on the same page. I'm planning on doing a more extensive video on this topic in the future, which will include basic mechanical understanding of how things work on the horn. But uh, for now, let's go through this briefly. So starting at the top of the saxophone on the back here, we have the octave key system. To the left of that, the palm keys being D, E flat, and F. And then we move into the first major stack, which I call the left hand stack, which consists of the front F key, which activates the palm F key, B, bis, A, and G, and what I call the C key, which is this small key which sits right below the front F. The B activates the little C key, and when you press A, it seals not only the bis, but also the little C. So that's a three pad system there, and the G, of course, is independent. Moving down the horn, we have the G sharp key, which is independent, and then the next major system, which is the right hand stack, which consists of what I call the F sharp key, F, E, and D. F activates the F-sharp, as does E and D. And at the bottom of the horn, we have our C-sharp, B, and B-flat key, which are all worked by what I call the left-hand pinky stack. G-sharp, B, B-flat, and C-sharp on the side there. Then we move into our smaller systems, being the C and E-flat key, which sit right here, also referred to as the right hand pinky stack, the chromatic or side F sharp, and then our side keys, B flat, C, and the high E. And that's it. Now let's take a closer look at all of the materials which make the horn play and feel the way it does. So the first material that we need to talk about when it comes to factory Selmer saxophones are the resonators. And there are two different styles of resonators that Selmer used um, from about 56,000 to right around 80,000. Selmer was using a nickel plated brass resonator that they called the Tonex resonator, T-O-N-E-X. And this is a two piece resonator. This uh, receiver which is internally threaded to receive a screw which would go on the back of the pad, the resonator of course going on the front of the pad. Um, this part is actually soldered onto this part 
and this is a hefty uh, this is a hefty piece right here and of course this was the original brass washer and then the screw right at 80,000 they started using a plastic or nylon resonator um, in this you know kind of chocolate brown color which did not have a washer it just had a slightly larger um, let me get that in focus there slightly larger brass uh, backing screw interesting to note that if you are um, restoring a vintage somewhere that has partially original resonators and you are swapping them out the threading on both of the smaller screws used on the Selmer Tonex or metal resonators and the threading used on the plastic ones are identical so those can be interchanged if you happen to lose these little guys which I do all the time so the reason for the change um, was pretty obviously a financial decision on Selmer's part uh, this is so much easier to make um, and cheaper material but interestingly enough I'll mention that I did hear from um, an old timer that the part of part of the reason for the change was just the weight difference. Um, oftentimes on tenor saxophone, in the right hand you'll have keys bounce, which means that if you release the key and it goes to its returning position without any kind of finger pressure, it'll flutter a little bit. And often that has to do with not only the shape of the key foot, sorry to get technical here, but it's kind of interesting, but also the weight of the key cup itself and the materials in it, meaning the pad, the adhesive, and the resonator. And again, these resonators weigh considerably more than the uh, the nylon boosters that they changed to at a later date. And uh, again, this um, repair technician told me that one of the reasons they changed was to lighten up the key cups, both for the action and to uh, prevent that bouncing. So the next step is the uh, summer pad which, um, you know, they went through several different manufacturers, but uh, they always retain this um, beautiful orange uh, tanned kid leather um, look to them. And, you know, they, they typically measure about five millimeters in thickness. And you can see on the back that uh, they used an amber colored shellac, um, which is a natural adhesive made actually from insects that um, was borrowed from the furniture industry. Um, shellac, which I have a stick right here, is um, when, it, when it's mixed with a solvent like alcohol uh, can be used as a varnish um, or a uh, finish on wood. So again, I said that I would share what I use to replicate uh, these styles of resonators in my own repair work um, for metal resonators. I prefer the ones made by Ed Krauss, who um, has copied these pretty well. If you can afford it, uh, the company Resotech makes a very, very fine replication, um, which includes even a soldered back like this one, uh, which are, are absolutely beautiful and they match the summer style perfectly. Um, for the plastic resonator, I like the Fariz brand which is a melt-in style, which means that there is no screw. You actually melt it into the, the back of the pad, but they match the doming and the color of these resonators perfectly. For pads, again, I think Fariz has the closest thing. Um, there's another company called Ed Meyer, which is a little hard to track down, but they make another very, very similar um, Selmer style pad and in fact used to produce the pads for Selmer I believe in the late 60s and the 70s For shellac, which again is the adhesive I use on the back of the pads. I like the Merit stick shellac Which uh, you can buy on furniture websites because this color which I believe is the amber color matches uh, the color of the shellac on the back of all the Selmer pads that I've seen almost so before we get into the saxophone itself, I did want to mention one other thing about the pad because there's certainly a trend in modern repair work to use very hard, thin saxophone pads. And you'll see when we look at the saxophone that these pads um, have, um, you know, a pretty thin layer of shellac on the back, which means that they're sitting inside the key cups pretty deeply, um, giving the overhang um, which is a term that I use that represents the amount of pad hanging out of the, the key cup itself pretty thin. So they look thin, but in actuality, these pads are, are on the thicker side. And um, even though 
you know, the, the newest original Mark VI pads that I've had are from the 70s, um, and the leather is dried up. You can tell that this is a very supple leather, and that the felt was not rock hard. It was more of a medium weave, 100% um, wool felt, being the material that's in between the leather and the cardboard backing. And I just wanted to comment that, you know, Selmer knew that the tone holes um, or chimneys coming off the saxophone that the pads were sealing on were not perfect. Um, and I think that they chose these pads for a reason to make up for the imperfections. That's why we have pads made out of leather and not metal, is to make up for imperfections in the tone hole. And you can see, look at the seat of this pad. I mean, it is, um, it is a solid seat. The seat being the ring this is where the resonator was I took that out to show you more of the leather but this ring here is where the pad was actually sealing on a tone hole for chimney on the saxophone and um, that is a that is a solid seat which is why often when I get original summer saxophones in the shop they still play great on their original pads because they're seated um, so strongly over those tone holes just another thought okay now that we have the terminology together let's go through each individual system on this horn and look at the choices that Selmer made in 1965 for materials. So starting with the top of the horn, I always notice this gray tubing up here. It's just a classy touch. Um, all of the inner workings of the octa mechanism are regulated with natural cork. I always like to point out in this one joint that uh, the cork is placed on the interior part, not the exterior. It's a small detail, but to me there are no such things when we're talking about these horns. For the palm keys, you see cork under the D, E flat, and F to control the height and the feel. Look at the beveling on the cork on that E flat key. It just shows you that somebody really cared about what they were doing that day. Moving on to the left hand, you see we have green felt under the front F key and under the A covering the bis. And on the back of those key feet, for A and B, you see we have uh, green felt controlling the regulation to the uh, little C key and natural cork resting against the body of the horn which controls the feel and the overall key height. The side C and B flat both have natural cork under their key feet. Now moving over to the left hand pinky stack. You see this is all green felt. Um, on the tenors interestingly you'll see that this particular piece will be cork and there will be green felt on the body of the horn as opposed to just one piece of green felt like you see on the altos. The G sharp and bis regulation screws which hang over the G sharp key from the F sharp key in the right hand are natural cork. Let's take a second and look at the uh, overhang or thickness of the pads in the key cups here. Again I showed you them off the horn and this is what they look like in the horn which is very thin, very crisp looking which is an indication that the Selmer factory was using just a thin layer of that shellac adhesive on the back of the pads. The chromatic F-sharp key has a piece of natural cork underneath it, though I have seen felt. I think it just depended on who was working that day or what materials were hanging around. For the caged keys, the E-flat, C, B, and B-flat, we see green felt in the bumpers. Now the back of the right hand you see we have, again, natural cork under the key feet, just like the left hand, green felt on top, and there's actually a small disc of green felt on the body of the horn underneath that cork, which controls uh, the bounce and the feel of each of those keys. So that is every material on this Mark VI from 1965. Okay, so briefly, here are um, the materials that I've chosen to mimic the ones that we just saw on the Mark VI, which, again, it's just felt and just cork, and it's amazing, but these two materials, um, to me, represent all you need to make a saxophone be quiet, feel great, and hold its regulation for a long time. So, for felt, I choose a green, of course. 100% wool felt and there are lots of different grades of felts out there the stuff you're going to get at the craft store or that's very inexpensive is typically a blended felt made out of rayon which is almost like a plastic and um, the difference in using 100% wool 
is that it's much stiffer, it's much more resilient. You can even sand it. Um, so this is beautiful stuff, and I believe this is what they were using on those horns. It holds its shape and uh, its dimension considerably better than cheaper felts. So um, one problem I have, though, is that it only comes in one thickness from JL Smith. It's pretty thick. This, for instance, is the size that you would put underneath the A pearl to cover the B, um, or the bisque, rather. Uh, but it's too thick to use on the back of the key feet for regulation of the back bar in the F sharp or the little C in the left hand. So what I do to get over that is I actually, you know, when I'm doing an overhaul or prepping an overhaul rather, I'll cut out a postage si uh, stamp size piece of this, back it with contact cement, uh, wait for it to dry, and then skive off the top layer, which, you know, trying to get about half this thickness is what I like to use. And for razor blades to do that, I use the uh, Jim Persona, which are super, super sharp and great for cutting this stuff. For cork, um, I just use the highest quality natural cork I can get, which I get from Fariz. Uh, cork, you know, to this day still amazes me as a material. It's perfect, um, and there's a reason that they chose this, because it is um, just the quintessential balance between firmness and softness. Firm enough when it's of this level of quality that it's going to retain its shape and thickness, but soft enough that it won't click even at a very thin sanded piece um, against uh, metal and won't bounce. Uh, so this is, you know, just beautiful stuff to me. Sounds silly, but that's how I feel. For adhesive, I try as much as I can to use liquid shellac. I have to admit, it is kind of a pain to use. I make this using flakes and denatured alcohol. It forms a paste, which I apply with paint brushes um, or acid brushes to the work. Um, you have to heat it up to burn off the alcohol, which then just leaves the shellac adhesive, um, which grips whatever materials you're using. And this is what they used on all those horns um, up until the very end. You don't see contact cement, even though it was available, I believe, in the 70s when they stopped the Mark VI run. They only used liquid shellac. So I'm learning to become uh, better at using this, but I want to because to me it represents that final detail, the final step in trying to mimic the original summer overhaul. Okay, so that's it. Um, I hope that whether or not you're a repair technician or an owner of a vintage summer saxophone that this was at least mildly informative. I believe that you should know uh, what the factory intended, whether or not you choose to do that um, in your own work or have that done to your own saxophone is entirely up to you. Like I said, this is um, the way that I like to approach my repair work and um, again I give credit to a lot of people uh, for moving me in this direction. This is certainly not an original idea. Um, you know, one of the first conversations I had with the great New York repairman Bill Singer, he said to me, I want to make the saxophones look like nobody was there. And that has really stuck with me. So once again, thank you for watching. And uh, like I said, I've got some other stuff uh, coming down the pipeline in terms of videos. So please stay tuned.